some uh, managers may be quant, quant oriented, you know, using computers to pick stocks. Uh, some managers may be momentum. Some managers may be value. We happen to be value managers. Uh, and we happen to be long term. So you have to look at things like turnover. You know, how often does the portfolio turn over? Which will give you some indication of what the manager is doing. He's a trader if he's turning over a lot. Um, and so you really have to look at the manager, not necessarily look at his performance against an index, because the index is the crowd. You want somebody who's not going to follow the crowd. And also not necessarily someone who is slightly underperforming peers, because peers may also be crowd followers. So they may get hit when the crowd goes the other way. So I really, I would say it's about uh, the philosophy and the execution of that philosophy and the size of the firm. In other words, you want a firm who is going to be able to make good on its commitments to you and to service you. In other words, when you pick up the phone, are you going to get an answer to what's happening? If you want to redeem your shares, will you be able to get your money? These are questions that you have to ask. A lot of the hedge funds, by the way, if you remember, many of the investors when they asked for their money back, they said, sorry, you're going to have to wait because we can't liquidate the portfolio. Or, sorry, we've lost it all because we were leveraged 10 to 1. These are the things you've got to ask. In our case, uh, at least for our emerging markets funds, we don't leverage. We don't use derivatives. Derivatives, by the way, are uh, the big, big danger in these markets. Uh, and we have lots of cash in our Franklin Resources organization. So if push comes to shove, we can pay. You know, if there's no liquidity in the market, we're able to meet redemptions. In all the history of our company, there has been, at least in my group, Emerging Markets Group, we've never had a case where we could not pay back. Even during this recent crash, you know, the subprime crisis, we were getting we were like a cash vending machine. You know, people were asking for their money back at the bottom of the market in uh, 08 and the beginning of 09. Uh, we never missed a payment. Um, so I think that's the kind of question you've got to ask, you know. Because service is a big part of our business. You know, service to the clients. Record keeping, that sort of thing. So you get your statements on time, et cetera, et cetera. Dr. Barry, it's Tim Johnston from the Financial uh, Times. Two questions. You mentioned Vietnam, Kazakhstan, Ukraine, Nigeria. What is it that makes those countries stand out? I mean, is it just that they haven't been touched by development yet? The second question is capital controls. There's a new move, particularly in this region, towards imposing capital controls. I know that Thailand's considering it. Are you, is that a threat to you? Is that a threat to the industry? Is that a threat to the countries in Asia? Big threat. <laughs> Uh, I'll give you an example. Venezuela. Uh, as soon as Chavez came in, we were out. We sold every single share. Thankfully, uh, there was an American company who was willing to buy those shares. <laughs> now they're selling them at half the value. Um, so not, we were not particularly prescient or smart, but we have a policy that as soon as capital controls are threatened, we're out. Because one of the things we need to have is liquidity. Because we're running, for the most part, open-ended funds. Clients may ask for their money back, and we've got to liquidate. So I would say capital controls are the death knell for capital markets. Uh, now, I'm not talking about cases where, and by the way, almost every country in the world has some form of record keeping, or some form of uh, rules and regulation which uh, uh, limit capital flows in and out. In other words, uh, some countries would say, okay, you've got 100 million you bought in, uh, you invested, uh, whatever you make on that 100 million plus 100 million you can take out, no more, <coughs> and so forth. That kind of thing is acceptable. But if they say, look, we're not gonna let you out like they did in Malaysia during the Asian crisis, that's a no-no. That's very, very bad. And it hurts the country over the long run. 
because it'll be very difficult in the future to get money coming in. See, a lot of these people uh, in, in the governments don't realize that uh, they think, oh, it's hot money coming in and out. When we buy a stock, there's no way for us to get out unless somebody else is willing to buy that from us. The money is not leaving the country. So they've got to get the, through their brain that uh, it's, a, it's a flow that has to be liquid and open. Very important. Why are we interested in uh, Kazakhstan, Vietnam, uh, Ukraine, Nigeria, and many other of these frontier markets? Is that for the most part, uh, they are, the companies are undiscovered. They're not well researched. So our research can be sort of the first there. We can go in and learn about the companies and discover something that nobody else has discovered. Um, so that really is the attraction of frontier markets generally. Uh, the markets are relatively underdeveloped, under-researched, etc. And we're looking at many other countries in Africa in particular, but places like Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, um, even Cambodia, um, so forth. You know, it's quite a few of those. Dr. Mobius, my name is Duncan Niven. I'm an investor with MBMG. And I keep hearing money men saying things like long term, medium term, short term. As a non money man, what does that actually mean in terms of years or months? Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, a lot of people say I'm long term, but in reality, they're not. And by the way, when we say long term, it doesn't mean that we go into a stock and we're holding it forever. Our average holding period, however, is five years. Some stocks we've held for 20 years. Now, I say average holding period. Some stocks we buy today and we may sell tomorrow for some reason or another. Uh, so when we're talking about long term, we're talking usually of a five-year time frame. So if you look at our documentation, we have, of course, you know, documentation uh, and looking at the balance sheet, profit and loss statement, cash flow of companies going back five years, going forward five years. We do a model. Uh, so we, what we do is say, okay, what do we think this stock is going to be worth five years from now? And then we buy on that basis. Now, it may turn out that things continue to get better for the company. We keep on revising and that five years gets lengthened to 20 years. So, uh, it, that's what we mean by long term. Um, <coughs> yeah, and when, when does an emerging market become an established market? Um, there's, there's lots of talk at the moment that, you know, now is Asia's time, that, you know, the US and Europe are weakening. I mean, they're still going to be the, the main powerhouses for some time. But when, when will some of these markets that people are looking at become more established? And the measure of emerging markets when we started out in 1987 was per capita income income. Uh, if you look at most of these markets, per capita income is below 5,000. Developed countries like the US, Japan, Europe, uh, you talk about 40,000. So that's what separates emerging from developed. But over the years, we've widened uh, the scope to include markets that are undeveloped or unrecognized for one reason or another. The Middle Eastern markets would be in that category where per capita income looks very high, but the markets are pretty undeveloped, uh, not well researched and so forth. So we go in to those markets. Some markets have g graduated to developed market status, but may come back to us, like Greece. Greece used to be an emerging market. We were investing in Greece. I'm back. <laughs> you know, because when they joined the European Union, they sort of graduated, you know. And same thing with Portugal. Portugal was an emerging market when we started out. So uh, there could be a two-way flow. <laughs> uh, hello. My name is uh, Sam Corey. I'm here independently. I uh, wanted to get your opinion on uh, the set before 
uh, the financial crisis was 750. It's now, I guess, about 860. Whereas the developed world markets are still considerably lower from where they were before the financial crisis, and it's the same thing in Malaysia and some of these these other markets. Do you, do you think that means that these markets are now safer, or or should investors still be looking back towards 1997 when it was 1700, and then it went down to three? Is it is it still is New York still safe, or is it that the other markets are now becoming the safe ones? That's what I'm. Mean. No market is safe. No market is safe. <laughs> Uh, these markets can crash just like any other, and the New York market the same. You could see uh, an incredible crisis take place, and these markets could go down dramatically. Uh, as I pointed out, the bear markets are usually very short-lived, which means they fall off a cliff. So you could have a big shock um, uh, in these markets, in any market, but that's true of course, the higher uh, turnover means the volatility can be very, very severe. You know, if a, if a stock market is very, very liquid, then you can have a very, very severe downturn. The other thing that we've uh, found, and this is why things get very interesting in these markets now, is uh, the total value of derivatives globally is six hundred trillion dollars. Six hundred trillion. That's ten times more than the total global GDP. These derivatives can create incredible volatility as we saw with the subprime crisis. You know, if you didn't have the credit default swaps if you didn't have collateralized debt obligations, you would not have had the kind of crash that we've experienced. So uh, I would say volatility is with us and here to stay. Uh, there's no escaping it. Uh, I'm not saying that in a bad sense because if you're willing uh, to do your homework you know, and buy things when they're really cheap, you can do very, very well and this volatility can help you. But it's difficult because, you know, the, uh, the average investor, he picks, uh, picks up the newspaper, or he talks to his friends and says, God, you know, market went down by 200 points or by 50%. I'm never going to buy another stock in my whole life. And then it goes down by 75%. He said, see, I was right. Then it goes up by 50%. He said, that's just a blip. It goes up by 100%. Ah, it's, um, I don't believe it. It goes up by 200%. Hey, this is getting interesting. I ought to go in now. This is the psychology. This is what happens. My, my famous sister-in-law, I know you heard this story, my sister-in-law, she bought my Emerging Markets Fund in 1993 in a bull market. 1994, big crash. Our net asset value went down. Unfortunately, I had to visit my brother in Buffalo, New York. I knock on the door. I hear her voice. Who's there? It's Mark. I'm not opening the door and give me my money back. <laughs> I said, if you open the door, I'll tell you how to get your money back. She opened it slightly. She kept the chain on the door. I said, buy more. She slammed the door in my face. <laughs> this is a typical investor. <laughs> Picking up on that point, for a second. Um, looking at the relative outlooks for China and for the States, is it possible that we could be in a situation where the world's largest market is an emerging market? <laughs> or does China have to become a developed market by that time? Uh, it's unlikely. You know, these changes take place. I mean, let's just look at per capita income. Mm -hmm. Per capita income in the U.S. is not going to go down to 3,000 very quick. You know, so it'll continue to be a so-called developed market. Uh, doesn't mean, by the way, that the, the U.S. market cannot go up. Sure. No, but I was uh, meaning, could, could China yeah. become the world's largest market? 
Oh, the yes. United States, oh. States and still oh, be yeah. an emerging market at that time, or will China have become? Oh, yeah. A, in terms of total market capitalization, China could, yes, could become the largest. So that the world's largest market could easily be an, an emerging oh, yeah. market? China and India. So I quite like the answer about the States. I hadn't thought of that one. But it might become a, deve a developing yeah. market instead of a developed. <laughs> Yes. My name is Horst Rudolf. I'm a freelance uh, political and economic advisor in the area. Um, I will just start with my third question because you mentioned the uh, derivative markets. Uh, they're all based on leverage. Without leverage, they would not exist like this. So is it not a first priority of the worldwide governments, or all governments in the world, to limit in any way the use of leverage for any type of investment and speculation or whatever, because investment we need, speculation we need for the future markets and so on. But the leverage might kill us again. This is one question. Another one, um, many um, investment sorry, advisors... Can, we, can, we just, um, can sorry. we just ask one question and let him answer oh. the first question first? Oh, let me ask yeah. one, one by one. Uh, let me ask the first, uh, answer the first one. Mm -hmm. uh, l leverage, I agree with you. I mean, I agree with the idea that no one should leverage. But unfortunately, <laughs> banks don't like that. <laughs> uh, banks want to lend. By the way, that's one advice I have to all investors. Don't borrow. There's no reason why people should borrow. They should live off their earnings. If they can't buy something, wait and save. I mean, that's the way to, to, to become rich, really. Uh, but in terms of the leverage, the... The problem, I, what I would ask for, because it's impossible to say you're going to eliminate all leverage, okay? What I would ask for is that any deposit-taking bank is not allowed to go beyond a certain level of leverage. In other words, uh, they cannot lend uh, more than a certain amount of their capital, number one. And number two, they're not allowed to risk their own capital, number two. And number three, they are not allowed to pass off their loans to someone else. In other words, the collateralized debt obligations out the window. You, if you make a loan, you've got to be responsible for that loan and you've got to hold it till maturity. So if they can institute those rules, that would go a long way towards ameliorating the possible risk. Uh, thank you. A totally different question. Uh, the last frontiers, as you mentioned, are certain countries. So my direct question, um, when and how will you invest in a country who yesterday got $8 billion earmarked from China? I speak about Myanmar or Burma, as some people say. Already some plans? Uh, eight billion for eight billion dollars for dam construction, for pipelines, for infrastructure, oh yeah. and so on and so on. So this market made the switch from unknown nothing to a more and more international, interesting investment place. That is the interesting thing that's happening to these frontier markets, particularly in Africa, in the resource-rich countries. You're seeing China come in. You're seeing India come in you're seeing Brazil come in. You must remember, a Brazilian goes to Angola, he speaks their language. They both speak Portuguese. He goes to Mozambique, they speak Portuguese. So there, there's a, a very interesting development where emerging countries are investing in other emerging countries in search of resources. So that becomes very interesting. You know, recently we were in Ghana and I, I love to go to shopping centers and markets when I go to a country. And I asked the people there, you know, I'd like to go to a shopping center. And they said, which one, the Chinese one or the local one? And I said, let's go to the Chinese one. I couldn't believe it. It was filled with Chinese goods and Chinese people in Ghana. So this is having a transformative uh, uh, impact where the Chinese are not only putting capital out, but they're putting people out there. And this is definitely going to influence and result in a more entrepreneurial uh, development in these countries. Uh, so you will soon go to Myanmar also? 
Yes. <laughs> okay, a last short question. Many uh, investment advisors or banks still say gold is a hedge against inflation. Well, I think normally the opposite is the case. Uh, only in special situations uh, like the destruction of a country, a war, etc., gold was and is a hedge. But generally, you just lose with gold in 95%. What is your opinion, please? The problem with gold is that it doesn't pay dividends and it doesn't pay interest. That's the problem. And if you're long term, you're probably going to do better off investing in a gold mining company or another company that pays dividends and, and grows. So that's the only uh, problem. But I would say there's nothing wrong and uh, over long term, gold will probably be trending upwards in dollar terms. You see, a lot of people forget the other side of the equation. It's not only the price of gold, but it's the price of dollars. And you know and I know that no currency retains its value. No currency. I don't care if you're talking about the Swiss franc or any other currency in the world. It never retains its value because it's not fixed to something substantive. It's subject to government policy. So in that sense, uh, gold is not a bad thing to have. Physical gold, I mean. And maybe some platinum and palladium, that sort of thing. If you can get it at a good price. Um, Michael Mackey, another freelancer. I just want to go back to this issue of the four countries that you mentioned. I noticed only one of them is Asian. Are you saying that the world trade in future will be much more global and are you stepping away from a current theory which says that Asia will pull us out of recession and that w with its correlative that intra-Asian trade is maybe the one to watch and I just wondered if you could also throw in the line about the emerging markets within Asia. Thank you. Yeah, the, the, the trend that has taken place during the last 20 years uh, because of this uh, move towards a market economy orientation and philosophy is that world trade has continued to go up and there's no break in that trend. World trade continues to increase uh, and that has been very beneficial for countries around the world uh, not only the emerging but the developed countries as well. What we see now of course is that the uh, the big centers of trade are becoming more diversified. In the past, it was the U.S. that was center. Uh, now, Europe has taken a big share. Of course, Japan was a big center as well. China, of course. All the countries in Asia that I can think of export more to China than the U.S. now. Um, Brazil is becoming a big center. So these countries, uh, in other words, are creating a diversified global economy, not as dependent on the U.S. as it was in the past. And of course, this makes for less risk uh, going forward. Uh, so I think these trends will continue. Mark Mogis, Umesh here from Bangkok Post. I have three, four small, small questions for you. One is the fear among all investors these days of a possible double dip in the uh, global economy. What would be your strategy? Firstly, would there be a double dip? Do you foresee it? Obviously, you can't predict, but possibly let us know. Second strategy, in case if there is a double dip. My second question is, with some markets now nearly on the high end of the PE, even including Thailand, which has gone up dramatically, do you still foresee and stick to the word of if you have money, it's time to invest. And if, if it is true, would you recommend some shares? I think everybody here is looking for some kind of a tip here. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, double dip, no. Uh, there will not be a double dip. You must remember the term double dip came as a result of the Great Depression in the U.S. in the 30s uh, because of the unwillingness or the mistake that the central bank made in not pumping money, continuing to pump money into the economy. Uh, that lesson was learned 
and therefore it will not be uh, the mistake will not happen again. So you've seen as a result of Greece, I mean I thought before Greece, you know, the printing presses would stop printing, uh, but they continue to print because the governments around the world, US, Japan, Europe, continues to keep money supply up there. Of course the, the acceleration uh, is not as great. I mean it's decelerating, but the, the amounts are very, very big. So I don't see any problem on there. So in terms of strategy, uh, since I don't expect a double dip, uh, I see world trade, world production uh, increasing at a pretty nice pace globally. The U.S. is going to grow this year. Uh, every country that I can think of is going to grow. There may be a few uh, countries that are not, but uh, they're all going to grow. And then uh, you come to the question of values because uh, emerging markets have gone up from the bottom of last year and the end of 08 uh, by 70, 80, 90, 100 percent. So obviously you say, wait a minute, uh, is it getting too expensive? The research we've done uh, looking at the PE ratios the price to book ratios, dividend yields over the years since 1987 in emerging markets place us now right in the middle. In other words, the highest price of book we saw was three times book average. The lowest was one times book. We're now about two. The same thing for P's and same thing for yields. Which means that Things are not as cheap as they were uh, at the beginning of last year, but there's still lots of opportunities. And you must remember, if you're looking at valuations like PE, there's a P and there's an E. The earnings are coming up because if economic growth is up, earnings are going to be up. Now, the numbers I just gave you, the middle range there are projected this year, what they expect in earnings this year. Okay, next year we may see another ramp up. So uh, investors are not looking at this year. This year is already in the market. The, the market's a leading indicator. We have to now ask what are we going to expect next year? And as far as we can see, uh, things look pretty good for next year. Because a lot of the investments uh, are going to start coming back. Um, the only danger to that scenario, of course, is government policy. If we see governments uh, taking measures to increase taxes, to restrict trade, uh, to impose more regulation, all of this will be bad for business, bad for earnings. So we have to keep an eye on that. And of course, you have to look at it on a country by country basis. In terms of tips, all I can tell you is public knowledge, what we have in the portfolio in Thailand, uh, PTT, uh, PTT Exploration, uh, Casacorn Bank, Syme Cement, uh, BC World, uh, Landon House. These are all companies that you know and uh, we still like, we still have. Well, I'm not saying I'm buying or selling, so no. Don't take that as a <laughs> as a tip. Um, what, one second, we've got uh, time for, for questions from Dan and the uh, other three gentlemen who are waiting. So Hi, uh, Dan Tenge with Bloomberg News. Um, uh, Vietnam Central Bank uh, just devalued the dong uh, for the third time since November. Just wondering uh, what you think the impact will be on the economy, on the stock markets, and uh, what does Vietnam need to do to reform its exchange rate uh, system? The Vietnam Dong uh, devaluation, of course, will temporarily help exports. But you must remember there's uh, two sides of the equation. Uh, there's imports as well. A weaker Dong means that you can import raw materials cheaper and you can import machinery, labor-saving, productive machinery. So they've got to be very careful in that respect. And uh, the best policy would be to allow a freer uh, dong uh, movement. In other words, allow the market to determine what a 
a good rate can be because governments can always make mistakes in that regard and of course speculators love that kind of situation you know so you can get uh, shocks to the system so I would say the best way for the government uh, in Vietnam to handle the foreign exchange regime is to free it up more and allow people to buy on the street buy and sell dong uh, at a market rate and then use that as the market rate uh, globally Yes. Uh, my name is Peter Dennis. I've been a private investor in the Thai stock market for about 15 years. And uh, during the period, I and my friends have found uh, far better returns from investing in the smaller or medium cap companies. And uh, I think the reason perhaps parallels what you've mentioned about Slovenia and Nigeria in that uh, where, where there's little research, where the, where the information is not readily available to everybody, it's possible to find such bargains and get superior returns. And I was wondering, therefore, with a huge uh, fund of more than two billion in the Thai stock market, to what extent you're able to access these opportunities, to what limit you, you place on the minimum amount of turnover or capitalization in order to invest in Thai companies? We do invest in these smaller companies because we have a Thai fund which uh, of course goes into smaller companies. We also have a smaller companies fund which goes into the small companies and they've done very well. Uh, I agree with you that uh, small companies in Thailand can do very well. If you get to know the companies well, know the management, see where they're going, definitely uh, I would recommend it. And we, we are investing in these companies. I didn't mention the names because obviously uh, <laughs> could create problems. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, uh, my name is uh, Yun Seo Ri, a student uh, from a uh, French business school and interning in an uh, NGO here. So my question is, uh, I saw uh, the, um, the recent IPO, uh, Agricultural Bank in uh, China, and uh, $22 uh, billion, dollars, first uh, biggest uh, IPO in the world. So now um, nine out of uh, biggest IPOs in the world are Asian, and four out of uh, 15 biggest IPO are uh, Chinese. So I was wondering if these IPO are correctly priced or overpriced and uh, if there is a premium by paid by investors, if this premium is uh, reasonable and based on uh, gross, pro gross provision. Yeah, it's a very good question. Uh, the IPO market uh, has been one of the reasons why uh, the emerging markets have been moving sideways because a lot of new paper is coming in. Um, of course, there is an increasing demand because more money is coming into emerging markets, but the IPO uh, sizes, particularly coming out of China, uh, are very great. We estimate this year, so far this year, about $96 billion has been raised in emerging markets IPOs. Last year was about $80 billion, and we expect by the end of this year probably 140 billion. Uh, whenever anyone has an IPO, you better believe it's going to be overpriced. So unless uh, they decide to change the pricing uh, to something more reasonable, uh, it's a better idea to step aside. Uh, unless you really are convinced with your homework that this thing is going to do well. We did a calculation of all the IPOs last year. And if you had taken stakes in all the IPOs, you would have made maybe 10%, which is no big deal, you know, considering the risk. And don't forget, you've got to tie up a lot of money on these IPOs. So I think you've got to be cautious. My general impression is, yes, the IPOs have generally been overpriced. Um, again, it's, it's a very you know, clear uh, situation. When somebody wants to sell you something and mounts road shows and gives you a big sales talk, uh, they've got to get paid for all this promotion. So uh, you can see the investment banks make a fortune on these IPOs. Uh, maybe uh, this will be uh, the last question, uh, not technical one. I was wondering uh, to achieve uh, the position where you are and maybe uh, you have some uh, source of motivation or your own philosophy about your profession. So 
uh, I was wondering what it is. Yeah, I mean, you must remember that uh, it's not just me that manages these funds. We have a big team of people. Uh, we have in our emerging markets group now 80 people scattered around 16 offices around the world. And so one motivation is to uh, keep these people fed. <laughs> and have them feed me. <laughs> so it's sort of a, uh, a, a family, you know. We uh, get along very well together. The average uh, period that people have been with us is over eight years, almost nine years now. Some people have been with us for over 20 years. So it's really a, a family, and we have motivation, of course, to stay alive by increasing our funds. And the only way you increase funds under management is by having good performance. So that's one motivation. The second motivation is uh, I love to travel. I love to visit different places. I love to meet new people, find out new things. Um, and there are not enough hours in the day, frankly, uh, for the interest. You'll find most of the people in this business tend to have very uh, eclectic uh, interests. So, you know, one day I'll be reading a book about uh, white slavery. The next day I'll be reading a book about the hedge funds and so forth and so on. And the same thing goes for our business. We're constantly moving from one kind of business to another. So that's really what's uh, great about this business. It's similar to you, journalists. I mean, if I wasn't a fund manager, I'd probably be a journalist. Because, <laughs> because you guys have the freedom to... To, to look at everything, you know, and uh, it's a great job. And you can do it till you're, till you drop dead, frankly. I mean, you can, there's nothing holding you back. I remember John Templeton, he uh, lived to 92 years old. He was 92 when he died. He kept on investing right up to the very end. So it's, it's a great profession. Thank you. Thank you. Um, if I can just ask a very quick closing question. I mean, how, how much of your own skin have you got on the game? Where, where do you actually invest? Uh, yeah, many people ask me, you know, where do I invest? And uh, I divide my um, assets into three parts, which, by the way, I don't recommend because it's not necessarily the best thing. Uh, one third is cash, mainly because I don't have enough time to, you know, to decide what to do with it. You need some help with portfolio yeah. allocation. <laughs> yeah, I need help with portfolio <laughs> allocation. One third is property, and one third is our funds. I only buy our own funds because I can keep an eye on them, uh, and uh, I don't buy anything else. I don't buy s individual stocks, mainly because uh, compliance is so onerous that you know, anything you buy or sell, you've got a report and blah, blah, blah. So it's better just buying our own funds. Uh, merging. And I don't buy any other, the only other fund outside of our own uh, emerging markets equity funds, I buy as the uh, emerging markets bond fund uh, run by Michael Hasenshaup, a brilliant fund manager. So th that's the way I invest. I don't recommend it to everyone, but that's, that's a policy. Um, Dr. Mobius, thanks very much for um, taking the time to come to the club today and Paul, thanks for moderating. Thank you. Um, sorry, sorry. sorry. If, if I can make one very quick um, announcement. Um, I said the wrong price for the DVD, so 350 baht, not 300. So the, the value's already gone up. Greg, sorry, could I, uh, could I make one last yeah. closing comment, which is that... Um, it's always a very special time when Dr. Mobius comes to visit us, but this, uh, this week has been even more special because on his trip to Bangkok this week, Dr. Mobius has actually uh, enjoyed his birthday. So MBMG have got a, a little birthday present here that we got for, uh, for Dr. Mobius. So Thank you very ha much. Happy birthday. Thank, Thank you for spending it with us. Thank you very much.